And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read one verse here, verse number 33. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 33. The Bible says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Now I preached the first half of this, I want to say either on a Wednesday night or Sunday night about a week or two ago, and this is uh, following up on that, second part two. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk this morning about um, what influences you, what impacts you, uh, and what um, outside uh, forces direct you. So, you're either going to be yielding to God or yielding to the devil uh, when it comes to making all kinds of um, decisions. Um, associations, communications, and this is going to tie in with the Sunday morning sermon uh, this morning. So evil communications corrupt good manners. The reason we uh, live in a nation where everybody, just everybody uh, has lost their manners, or most people do not have manners, is because we have evil communications. And people don't, don't know how to treat each other because something has been evil, evil affecting our minds. And so, uh, it's very subtle sometimes, and it happens slowly over time periods. Uh, and we, we, a lot of times, we don't realize that it's happening. And it's almost like if you take a, a clear glass of water, two clear glasses of water, and they look the same, you pour them from the same spigot, and just, you keep adding a drop of strychnine or poison into one glass, it'll look the same. You can't tell the difference. One drop at a time will poison that to the point where it will kill you. Now, it looks the same. You can't tell. And people are the same thing, ladies and gentlemen. Churches are the same thing. Books are the same thing. You say, well, people look the same. Churches look the same. Books look the same. But they're not the same. And it's going to impact you whether you think it will or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you're cognizant or not, it will impact you. If you drink water, you know, if you search this, drinking water is one of the best things you can ever drink, if not the best. I drink juice, I drink, uh, you know, green tea and stuff like that. I'm not saying that's bad for you, but there's nothing like water itself. Because water has the characteristics of cleaning your body. The other ones give you nutrients and vitamins, and there's nothing wrong with them. But you ought to clean your body out with pure water as much as you possibly can get it pure, obviously, you know, clean water. Well, that's the Word of God. The Word of God is pure water and it cleans you out. If you don't have pure, clean water, you're going to be washing and drinking dirty water. I've said this before. Um, my wife and you ladies, you don't clean in a washing machine with dirty water. You put clean water in there from, from, the, from the water line. Why? Because you want your clothes to be uh, clean. Well, I don't understand why people don't read the King James Bible. Because anything other than the King James Bible is dirty water. And you don't realize, you say, well, why do these clothes come out so dirty? Well, look at the water. It's filthy. Well, why, why, why am I so messed up? Look at the water that you're drinking. The spiritual water that you're drinking. Why am I so spiritually anemic? Look at the spiritual meat that you're eating. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Your thinking is going to be messed up. Your direction in life is going to be messed up. Your decisions are going to be messed up. Why? Because you're, somebody is impacting you with the wrong information, trying to derail you from living a life that's pleasing to God Almighty. And so I cannot, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this kind of a Bible study where evil communications corrupt good manners. 
Take a Bible, please. Turn with me to uh, uh, Proverbs chapter number 2. Actually, let's go to Proverbs 13. I don't want to go over too many other verses that we've gone through before, but some of them are, are important enough to do so. Proverbs chapter number 13. Right in the middle of your Bible is a book of Psalms, and right after Psalms is Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 13. Verse number 20, Proverbs chapter number 13 and verse number 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. That's what it says. Now, I'd rather believe God than a philosopher or a worldly counselor or somebody who's not saved. I know you can read how-to books, you know, how to get smart, how to uh, finances or health and stuff like that. And look, a lot of that stuff might be good be honest with you, from a worldly perspective, from a worldly standpoint. But when it comes spiritually, which is a foundation of all truth, the Word of God, God says if you want wisdom, first of all, James 1.5 says, ask, if you need wisdom, you ask God. And He's promised, God has promised to give you wisdom if you ask Him for wisdom. Obviously, people are not asking God for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. And so that wisdom will be given as, as soon as you ask God for wisdom, he'll answer that. Don't, don't say, well, God won't listen to me because I've got sin in my life. Well, everybody's got sin in their life. Everybody has sin in their life. You hear me? Either sin willingly or sin unwillingly or presumptuously or unknowingly. There's not a person alive who doesn't sin every single day. I don't care what anybody else says. Everybody has some kind of sin, um, some kind of temptation, some kind of... A weakness, everybody. So when God says that you ought to pray, don't feel so guilty. Say, well, you know, I don't, I don't feel like going to God because God knows I'm sinning. Well, why don't you go to God and ask God for help for that sin? God will listen to that. Why don't you go to God and say, God, I need help. I need wisdom to know how to handle. I don't want to sin, God. Please help me. God will listen to that prayer. But if you don't confess your sin to God openly, confessing it not to people, but to God, then you're right. God's not going to hear anything you've got to say because your pride is in the way and you're not willing to admit that you have a problem with a certain area. Let me repeat this. There's not a person alive that doesn't have a problem in some area or areas. There's not a person alive. The only, per the only people who don't have a problem with sin are people who are saved and have died and gone to heaven to be with Jesus. That's the only people who have no problem with sin. Amen? Until you die, you're going to have this con constant conflict between the world, your flesh, your soul, your mind, it's going to be a battle. And the, the battle in life is for your mind. I'm telling you right now. That's the battle in life. And so God says, if you want wisdom, ask him for wisdom. Everybody needs wisdom, so everybody ought to ask God for wisdom. Well, if you read the Word of God, you'll find out how to get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing the Bible says. Therefore, get wisdom with all you're getting. I forget how it says exactly, uh, but wisdom is the principal thing. And so God says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But all Hiles said, man, I, and I said this, uh, this, uh, this quote, as much as I'm going to botch it up, I forget. But he says this, he said, he said um, you will not become what you want to become. You will become who you hang around with. Let me repeat that. You will not become what you want to become. You will become who you hang around with. You've heard the phrase, birds of the same feather flock together. Of course, that goes against mixed everything, you know. That's not very popular today. But the truth is, birds of the same feather flock together. If you believe the, the uh, King James Bible and you believe the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, then you ought to go to old-fashioned Baptist church that preaches from the King James Bible. That's not complicated. Because if you know, like I did when I first got saved, because I was ignorant and stupid and I just didn't know, I was going to a church where I got baptized where they were using uh, the New American Standard Version, they were using a Revised Standard Version, and you know what happened? My growth in Christianity was stunted because I was drinking poison, dirty water. I didn't realize it. But you know what happened? I kept asking God for wisdom. And you know, it's amazing how God answers that, man. And God will send somebody... Uh, to me, it was two people on the radio, man. 
I was listening to a religious radio program in South Jersey there, and I listened to these two fellows on the radio every single Sunday afternoon. And you know what? They would always talk about the old time religion and the King James Bible, man. And I said, wow. And so I found out that my pastor, Baptist Church, was lying to me. Now, I got baptized in that church. And I had heartstrings attached there. But I'd rather obey God than man. And by the way, that's why this church is here. If I decided to stay a lukewarm, if I decided to stay back since, ah, I don't care about the King James Bible, and I don't care about the old time religion, I don't care. You know what? I may be out of church, may have ruined my life, not doing anything for God, not going so with it. I thought it was all, I was all right, but you know what? As I started reading and believing the King James Bible, I started to grow. You know why? Because I was putting away evil communications away from me that were ruining me and destroying me without me knowing it. And I was saved at the time. Evil communications corrupt good manners. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Watch this. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Who are your buddies? Drinking buddies? Yeah, you're going to be destroyed. You know how many, I want to say, innocent boys and girls and teenagers have died in early death because they were hanging around a, a bunch of other teens that are drinking and they died in a head-on head -on collision while their friend was driving drunk? Two, three, four kids killed in a car accident, head-on collision because one person was driving drunk and all the other people were, were innocently killed? Why? Because who their friend was who their companion was. They didn't think it was that important. They, you know, I don't want to make them feel bad, you know. You, you know, I like breathing. I do. I like breathing in and breathing out. I like living. I really do. With, even with all its heartaches and burdens and struggles and trials, I love breathing. I love living, man. I can't wait to see Jesus, but you know what? It's more needful for me to be here, just like it's needful for you to be here for everybody else. That's what Paul wrote. And so if we're going to be here like we should be here, then let's do our best to stay away from the evil communication that is bombarding us on a daily basis from the news and television and radio and, and billboards and newspapers and social media. It's being bom they're bombarding us. And it's most of it, 90%, 95% is evil communication. And it's corrupting us. Take a Bible, please, sir, with me to uh, Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Right before Proverbs is the book of Psalms. Psalm 1. It's not Psalms 1, it's Psalm 1. It's the book of Psalms, but Psalm 1. Just a pet peeve I have as well. So. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Did you read that? God said you're blessed if you walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You have people, do, you, do you have friends that mock and criticize the old-time religion? Mock and criticize the old-fashioned Baptist church and the, and the preacher? I'd stay away from them. I did. You know what happened? To, and you know what happened in my life? And I didn't do this purposely, uh, but when I started standing for what was right, everybody else just fell by the wayside. And they chose... Not to associate with me because they're, I guess, too embarrassed, you know. Pastor, you're just being too extreme. You're being too argumentative. You're being too divisive, Pastor. You're being too whatever you want to call it. That's what, there was a division because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Many of his own disciples left him, the Bible says, because of the hard teachings and hard sayings that, that Jesus was preaching. Well, if it's going to happen to Jesus, don't you think it's going to happen to you? But here's the danger. The danger is we want so many people to like us and love us, we're willing to associate even with the devil's crowd. I don't know about you, but my heart breaks for these kids who are being shot and killed, man. You know why? Because they're hanging around the wrong crowd. Most of them. Now, some of them are innocent bystanders, and sometimes there's a stray bullet that goes into a house and kills somebody. I understand that. 
the vast majority are, of them are hanging around the wrong crowd. They don't want to go to God's house. They don't want to be involved with God's people. They don't want to stand out and be different from, from the world. They don't want to associate with the, with the old time religion. And so they yoke up with the world, the evil element, the criminal element, and they're going to suffer the consequences. Just like you and I will suffer the consequences if we do the exact same thing. Yeah. Do you know, do you know how many marriages have ended in, in divorce because of liquor? Drugs? Do you know how many, how many men are, are, are taking the milk money from their kids and the rent money and the grocery money and just shooting their veins up with heroin and, and snorting stuff and sniffing stuff and popping stuff? Huh? It's the wrong crowd. It's the wrong crowd. Why is it that no one's asked me if I want to buy any drugs? Why is it? I can't remember the last time. I mean, you know, we were growing up, it was all liquor and drinking and alcohol. But uh, after I got saved in 1978, you know, uh, I wasn't involved with the drugs at all. But, you know, after I got saved, none of my buddies ever asked me to go out again. I, I didn't think about it for about, I don't know, two, three, four years later. But I got saved, started going to church, started reading my Bible. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, hey, you know, they, just, they stopped asking me to go out on Friday night drinking and partying. They stopped asking me going out Saturday night and partying. And I never put the two together, but when you start walking with God and hanging around God's people, the world's going to slip away from you and stay away from you because they're convicted, they feel bad, or they don't want to you know, say, you know, you're doing right, you just keep doing what you're doing, but we're not ready for that. Or whatever their statements are, you know what I'm talking about. But a lot of times they just feel conviction because you're living right. I don't want to go back to the old way I used to be before I got saved. I don't want to go back to the drinking and alcohol where I used to go, uh, the place I used to go before I got saved. I don't want to go to the same crowd, same bars, the same grills that I used to go. I go to God's house. I say, Pastor, aren't you going to church too much? How come nobody says that about concerts and bars and grills and amusement parks and, and, this, and concerts? How come people don't say that about that? Huh? You went skiing last week, you're going to go again this week? Huh? You went shopping last week, you're going to go shopping again this week? Why don't you use the same argument when it comes uh, to, to God's house or God's people? It, the Bible says we ought to be addicted to the ministry, amen? I, I'd rather be addicted to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ than addicted to some drug or pornography or gambling or some other kind of lust or some other kind of want or need that I would think that I would perceive in my, in my life. Keep reading here. Psalm 1. Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hey, when's the last time you read your Bible? Day and night. Huh? You, guys start, you can't help but get changed and God changed you by reading this book. The reason people aren't changed is because they're not reading this book. Verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Did you read that? It doesn't matter what you do. God's promise to prosper you if you're, if you're not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not standing in the way of sinners. You're not sitting in the seat of the scornful. Your delight is in the law of the Lord. You, you meditate day and night in the word of God. He's promising you'll, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know why we have times of failure in our lives? Because we're not doing exactly what he said. Every, you know, John L. Rice used to say every, every failure is a prayer failure. How much time have you spent on your knees in your prayer closet and, I'll, and then you can look at your life you know, we don't pray because nobody sees us praying. We, we don't, you know, we don't mind coming to church because other people get to see us, you know. But the prayer closet is where Satan's going to hit you first. He's going to hit you there and you feel guilty because you're your sin. So you don't go to the prayer closet to ask God for help and power and strength and wisdom for this sin problem that you have. So he hits you in your conscience not to pray. And guess what? You're hanging around the wrong crowd. You're doing the wrong things. You're thinking the wrong things. 
Verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. I went to Greece in 1968, um, and I'll talk about this a little later uh, in the morning sermon, but, you know, no electricity in my mom's home village, no lights, no telephone. There was one telephone in the, in the, in the village down at the bottom, and uh, she used to yell out to the top of the mountains for somebody, hey, there's a telephone call from America, they're going to call back in 15, 20 minutes, come down, and you'd have to run down the mountainside and wait by the telephone to get a phone call. I mean, this is 1968, okay? Now they're too modernized, just like America, but regardless. And uh, I remember one of the times we took a, a movie, you know, uh, silent movies at this point. I still, I still remember, it's indelibly printed in my mind. Some girl in, the, in, in Greece in the summertime, hot summertime, by the way, dressed like you, like an Amish person, Amen. like a Mennonite. She was threshing wheat, I don't know what it was, I don't know what kind of grain it was. She was having a pitchfork or whatever. And here's what she would do. She would go in there and she'd throw it up. The grain would fall, but the chaff would be blown away by the wind. And that's all she kept doing. She was, some kind of a pitchfork. She would take it and nonstop just go like this and the grain would keep falling and the chaff would blow away. That's what God likens the ungodly like, like the chaff that the wind blows away. The grain stays, but the wind blows the chaff away. So what happened to so-and-so? They went off the deep end. Psalm 1, ladies and gentlemen. Psalm 1. Everything they do will not prosper because it says the ungodly are not, the, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In verse 4, the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. When you don't have a foundation, when you don't have a, an anchor in your soul that wind's going to come, and just get, get in a rowboat without an anchor and just let the wind take you. And let, the, let the waves take you. And you, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Have you ever gone fishing in a small boat? A small boat? You know what I'm talking about. Even in a big boat, it'll take you. But you drop that anchor down, man. You, we've gone deep sea fishing off Massachusetts and New Hampshire there, man. And we're going out 5, 10, 15 miles out, 20 miles out. And I love going for blues and other big fish. But they'll drop the anchor big boat that carries about 50, 60, 70 people. Why? Because if you don't have an anchor, that wind, the waves will take you off course. When you don't have the anchor of the Word of God, when you don't have an anchor of the church, uh, the house of God, and the people of God, and the things of God, the wind's going to blow you off to and fro, like winds of doctrine carried about. And you're going to go this way because somebody got your ear. You're going to go that way because you saw something on YouTube. You're going to go that way because some Mormon or Jehovah's Witness talked to you. Or you're going to go uh, so, uh, uh, some wind of doctrine, some evangelicals talk to you. But when you're grounded and the house is built on a rock, not the sand, the winds of time can come, but it will stand. I, I th one of the greatest illustrations I ever saw in my life, and I mean in the top five I've ever seen. I can't remember, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, maybe 25 now, one of the big hurricanes that came down uh, southeast America. I can't remember to tell you where along the coast. I'm, guess I'm guessing Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. I just can't remember for the life of me where it was at. The whole, the entire, all the, the blocks of houses on stilts and poles were wiped out. I mean, square miles, except one house. They built it to be hurricane-proof. They must have put pillars down, man, like 20 feet down, 30, I have no idea. But they took this picture, and all through the devastation, the houses were gone, I'm telling you. Tidal wave, everything was gone, like a tsunami had come and just taken everything away, except one house, standing by itself. That's what this is right here, man. The winds of time can change, but if you're grounded in the Word of God and your house is built on a foundation, you ain't moving, man. Sure, the paint may be peeling. Sure, some of the shutters or, or the, the, the flat board may be coming off. Some of the shingles may be blown off, but uh, you're going to be standing. You know why? Because you're built on a solid foundation. And that's what you need. You need a solid foundation, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Take your Bible, please. Turn with me to uh, um, Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. 
I was saying this, uh, I think this last Wednesday, and I don't remember now. When you get to my age, you'll forget a lot of things too. But uh, it's an amazing thing. I got saved in 78, and I went into the Marine Corps in 1981. And I was in the Marine Corps for three years. And you know, when you, and I'm glad I went into the Marine Corps because you learn a lot of discipline, uh, especially in boot camp that I still have with me. Um, Irish penance and the whole, whole nine yards, you know, it's just, but I'm glad I went through it because it taught me how to uh, be self-disciplined, be honest with you, and it, it, somebody kicked some discipline in me that I needed for the rest of my life, like we all need. And so I got out of, uh, out of the Marine Corps, I, I left early, about a month or two early, because I saved all my time, so I got out like in December of 83, I was supposed to get out in, in February of 84, but I saved my time, got out late December, and so, um, after, you know, you got, a, you got a, a haircut like a Marine, you know. And I, was, uh, I think I was telling folks Wednesday night, we, used, we had, at that time when the kids were growing up, we had every year we'd take a family picture, a family portrait. We had them up in the living room. So every year you would see, you know, uh, a new person added, a baby added, you know. You would also see hairstyles. It'd be very interesting to go back 25 years and look at all those photographs year by year by year. And I'll never forget this. I think the first year we started doing this is when we got to, to New Jersey. We moved up from North Carolina from uh, Camp Lejeune. And the first year we had, uh, I think, just a baby, uh, Athanasia, when she was a baby. And uh, I couldn't believe how long my hair was after I got out of the Marine Corps. You know why? Because you're back in the world. You're working, you're in the world, and so you're not in the you're not in the confined, uh, strict environment of a military base where everybody's got a high and tight. You're not you're no longer in that base where everybody looks the same as far as a haircut's concerned. So when you get out, like it happened, and I was saved by the way. When I got out, you know, I was working at the courthouse, I was working, uh, uh, I was whatever. A life was going on. But little by little, without me acknowledging and realizing it, my hair was going longer again like it was back in the 70s before I got saved. Until I went to my first pastor school and heard Dr. Howells preach. And he tore me upside and down, man. Up one side, down the other. I remember the statement he used to make every single pastor school. He said, you know, you, you, felt, you, you guys in here, man, you have some of the prettiest uh, Shirley Temple hairstyles I've ever seen in my life. I felt so guilty, man. I was saved, born again. In the Mar just got out of the Marine Corps. Blessed be God, I got home that Monday, man. I went to the courthouse. I was a court reporter in Camden, New Jersey at, the, at Superior Court. Lunchtime on Monday morning, I went and got a haircut. I said, I don't know what I told her. Give him a military haircut. I can't remember. i be honest with you, I just don't remember. But I got a haircut. I came back in and the clerk said, the first thing she said, John, she said, man, you look like a banker. All I did was get a haircut. Because I got convicted by a man of God that was preaching to about 7,000 men that were not right with God. Got a good kick in my rear end to get right with God. You know what happened? I started to walk with wise men. That's why you're here this morning. Not because uh, um, uh, God somehow uh, uh, sprinkled, sprinkled dust and magic dust and you're poof, you were here. You're here because some, some people have decided to walk with wise men. We're not concerned about numbers. I am concerned, but that's not the priority, number one. I'm not concerned about how many people like us. I'm not concerned about it whether it's popular or not. I'm concerned what my foundation says, what truth says, and I want to be like God, what God says in the Word of God. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make this illustration. I hate to get off course, but I'm going to make an illustration. I was talking about this uh, when, I'm, when I was getting ready to preach this morning. And this is a perfect illustration. If you take... Uh, pictures, photographs, and I said about photographs Wednesday night, but let's go to just photographs, okay? If you, if you take a photograph of the lifestyles and the dress styles and how everybody lived in 1900 and 1920 and 1940, 1960, 1980, and you get all, you know, with the bell bottoms in there, you know, and, and the uh, psychedelic, psychedelic t-shirts and stuff like that, and the peace signs, and the hairstyles. And you take all that, and you could see how fashion has changed from the 1900s to, let's say, 1980, 1990, whatever. 
or even today. In every area. You could, I'm telling you, I've seen videos, movies of independent fundamental Baptist uh, church services where the women were wearing sing specials, where the women were wearing skirts to their knees that you would think, man, what's going on? Well, that's the influence of the 60s with the miniskirt. That's the influence of the 70s. It impacted the church. And so even, in, this is a church that John O. Rice was preaching in. And he was, he got up one time, somebody was singing a special, some lady was singing a special. He got up and said this. He said, now that hussy's done singing, now we'll get to the preaching. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. That's what he said. It, it impacts you more than you realize it. But in that same, in that same strip of photographs that, that depict all the, the, um, the uh, clothing lines and the, uh, the fashions from the 1900s to today, underneath that, I would do the exact same thing for the Amish people. 1900 looks just like 1920. 1920 looks just like 1940. 1940 looks like just like 1960. 1960 looks like just like 1980. 1980 looks like just like 2022. I don't think you realize how far we have come away from God. So when you have an old-fashioned old preacher coming up and preaching, people are going to obviously hate it because they have to change some things. You have to change. You have to stop drinking your liquor and alcohol. Stop taking your drugs. Stop hanging around the wrong crowd because God commands us to separate from the world. Proverbs chapter number 28. Is that where we're at? Verse number 7. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. Who you hang, who's your acquaintances? Who are your uh, companions? Who are your friends? Evil communications corrupt good manners. You, you can tell a lot about a person by who they hang around with. Let me repeat that. You can tell a lot about a person by who they hang around with. You can tell a lot about a person about who hates them. Look, take this any way you want. I'm glad that BLM hates me. I'm glad that the Sodomites hate me. I'm glad that, the, uh, that Antifa hates me. I'm glad that the atheists hate me. I'm glad that the feminazis hate me. I'm glad that the, le the left-wing socialists hate me because that's exactly where I want to be, amen? I'm contrary to everything they stand for. I'm against everything they stand for, just about. Somebody said, uh, and pretty good, he says, you know, if Hillary Clinton is for it, I'm probably against it. Now, back then, it was uh, Jane Fonda. If Jane Fonda's for it, I'm usually against it, amen? And that's a pretty good indication of, of things in life, amen? Not, not everything, probably, but the vast majority of things, if she's for it, I'm against it. If I'm for it, she's probably against it. Proverbs chapter number one. Since we're in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter number one. Your language will suffer. Amen. Your mind. Uh, uh, why is it that nobody's told me uh, dirty jokes? Why? I'm talking to even at work before I retired. Why did they, after the first time they asked me about the football pool, why didn't they ask me for the next 10 or 20 years? They asked me the first time, hey, you want to join the pool? I said, I do. I, I like to join it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I used to play the pool all the time in, in, in high school, man. And I was pretty good. I really was. I don't want to get into my gambling, but I was pretty good playing poker. And I, I like playing it, to be honest with you. But it's not right. It's evil. Because the people you're hanging around that's gambling are not right with God. They're smoking, they're cussing, they're swearing, they're cheating, they're lying. Yes, Proverbs chapter number one. Verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Hey, let's go get a drink. 
No, I don't think so. Hey, let's go to the bar. Oh, I don't think so. If sinners, that's what it says. If sinners entice thee, consent them and just say no. You know, I, I hate to reiterate what Nancy Reagan said, but just say no. You can say no. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, the Bible says. You can say no. No one's forcing you. No one's putting a gun to your head to say you have to take this drink or take this drug. You're choosing to do that. God says, consent thou not. Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs 4. Verse number 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. Let me repeat that again. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. In uh, where well, we going to church in New Jersey, Heritage Baptist Church, lady, black lady, Mary, lived in Camden, very bad area. Um, she was saved. Her husband would never want to come to church. Uh, her, her son and her daughter came to church with her. And uh, we were out in the suburbs in a nice white con conservative area, but this is a, a very nice godly lady. She brought her boy and her, son, her daughter to church with her every single time she came. She taught her son. You think about this. This is 1985. You think about what I'm telling you. When they're walking to school, if you see a girl not properly dressed in front of you, cross the street and go to the other side. I don't want to say a single mother, but she was saved, her husband was not. She came to church, her husband did not. Her children were probably, my wife will attest to this, probably the best kids in the entire church. Friendly, kind, mannerly. You say, well, you're just too strict. Yeah, evil co communications corrupt good manners. Yeah. Evil communications corrupt good manners. God says avoid it. Avoid it. That's what he said. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Why this happen to me, Pastor? I don't know what happened. Well, because you're obviously not reading your Bible because you would know why. Not reading the Bible, not praying, not coming to church, not being right with God. I don't know. A lot of reasons why. But the world, the lost have no idea why this happened to me. Well, bad decisions. You married an Abel, you shouldn't have married Married a Jezebel, you shouldn't have married. You didn't know that because you probably weren't saved. You know how many people got married meeting somebody on a dance floor? Drunk? You know, after three or four drinks, even Hillary might look good. I I'm just saying, you know, you don't know. You get intoxicated and drunk, and you make decisions just like that? And you're going to be liable for the next 18, 20, 30 years? Because you're hanging around the wrong crowd. Because some minister, some pastor, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, everything matters. Proverbs chapter number 5. Verse number 8. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Talking about harlots and prostitutes. Just don't go near her. It's, it's not that difficult. Just don't go near it. Uh, look at Proverbs chapter number 9. Proverbs chapter number 9, verse number 6. Forsake the foolish and live. And go in the way of understanding. Proverbs chapter number 12. Verse number 11. He that tell... I'll wait till you get there. Proverbs chapter number 12. Verse number 11. He that telleth his land shall be satisfied with bread. But he that followeth Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Elton John, and all these other queer homos is void of understanding. Their whole life is wrapped up in following the Grateful Dead around the whole country. Get in your hippie van from the 1960s uh, uh, painted with psychedelic colors on there and just go from city to city and camp out there and following the Grateful Dead. And then you wonder why they don't do anything in their entire life. I'm just a free spirit, man. That's where these bums are, are peddling, uh, not peddling, uh, trying to beg for money on the street. 
drink, drinking their liquor bottles for the last 20, 30, 40 years. They end up on the street. And you feel sorry for them because they made the wrong decisions. They could have been in God's house. They could have gotten saved. They could have been in church. They could be living right. They chose wrong. I, I'm trying to spare you from some bad decisions that will ruin your life, man. And some of us in this room have already been hurt that way. You know that. And we ought to be at least an example to other people, especially the young people. Don't make the mistakes I made. Again, Proverbs 12, verse number 11. He that tilleth his land, land. It's hard to do that when you have an apartment. I'm just saying. He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread. But he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. You're more concerned what Gene Dixon's predictions are than what God says in the Bible. That's pretty sad, you know. You're, you're so consumed with what Nostradamus said, you know, 150, 200 years ago. How come you're not consumed with what Jesus said? What Daniel said? Proverbs chapter number 14. If you want to underline this one. Underline all of them. Proverbs 14, verse number 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. No one tells you you have to hang around fools and drunks. No one tells you that. Well, I feel bad for him, Pastor. Well, try to win him to the Lord. Try to bring him to church. But that's about it, man, when it comes to fellowship. Uh, look at Proverbs chapter number 16. We'll go in order. Proverbs 16, verse number 29. A violent man entith, enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him in the way that is not good. Proverbs chapter number 20. Proverbs 20, verse number 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Watch this now. Therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Oh, you're so good. You better stay away from somebody like that. Now, your wife ought to tell you that. Your husband ought to tell you that. If somebody else tells you that, you better stay away from them, man. I'm just telling you. Because you're going to get a big head. I'm telling you. It happens. It's ha Look, we're all flesh, man. We're all a bunch of sinners. We all have we all that element of pride and ego that will just, it'll kill you. It'll destroy you. I don't want somebody telling me. And I don't mind people saying, you know, whether it's a good Bible study, you know, or a good sermon. I don't mind that at all. But I'm telling you, when you, I never told my kids that they were good. You do whatever you want. I said when they did something, I commended them for what they did, not who they were. I know what you do. So I believe in you. What in the world does that mean? What, what does that mean? I believe in you. They're a sinner. They're wicked. They're evil. So you want them to be evil and wicked and sinners? You ought to commend them and applaud them when they do something that is right. And commend the action, not the individual. Now, I know people need encouragement, but encourage them in what they're supposed to do, what is right. Proverbs 20, verse number 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer we reveal his secrets, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Verse number 1. Be, thou, be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. That's what it says. Don't desire to be with them. We're running out of time. Romans chapter number 16. We'll close here. Romans 16. Romans chapter 16. Sixth book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. Romans 16 and verse number 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and 
Avoid them. Is that what it says? Avoid, that's what it says, just avoid them. I don't want to, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge now, I don't have one person in here on my phone that is a sodomite. Because I don't think they want to be my friend. I'm their friend, but they don't want to be my friend. And I understand that. As far as I know, to the best of my ability, the best of my knowledge, I don't have one person in here that associates themselves with Antifa or BLM. I like it that way. As far as I know, there's not a person on here that I have personally contact on my phone that hates God. I like it that way. It's not that I hate those individuals. I'm trying to win them. When I meet them, I'm trying to encourage them to get saved, trying to encourage them to live for God. But I'm trying to avoid them, just like Romans chapter 16, verse 17 says. Hey, you want to be wise? Walk with wise men. You want to be a fool? Walk with fools. And you'll see the end, of your result, the, end, the end result of your life will be exactly what you decided, what you chose. Let's all stand, shall we? Dear God, thank you again for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for being such a wonderful, merciful God. And Lord, help us to walk with thee, because if we walk with thee, we'll be more like thee. Bless these dear folks. Give us safety for those who are still coming to church. Bless the morning, the singing, and the preaching. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll take about maybe eight minutes to come right back. Eight minutes.